Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about the one-way repeated measures analysis of variance. In our last video, we talked about the basic logic of the test. This time, let's go through our first example. I already have this example worked out, but we're going to work out plenty of it together by hand from scratch. And then we'll make sure we walk through every single step so that you know how to compute your F ratio. All right, let's see what we're dealing with here. The data below represents wellness scores for five people across four levels of treatment. So let's assume that we're dealing with five people who are depressed, and we're testing a new treatment for depression, and it's a drug. And we're doing a dosage study because we want to determine how much of this drug can we give them and still have some added benefit. This particular study is designed so that we're going to test four different levels of the drug. During the first month of treatment, they're going to get zero milligrams of the drug. Essentially, they're getting a placebo. During their second month, they're going to get 10 milligrams of the drug. During the third month, we're going to boost it to 20 milligrams. And then during that fourth month, we're going to boost it to 30 milligrams. You can see we're measuring the same five people at four different periods in time. This is the exact type of situation where we would want to use a repeated measures analysis of variance. All right, and we're going to test that with an alpha of 0.05. Let's change views and work on all of the prep work that is necessary to work through all the formulas that we're going to need to compute. Keep this in mind. The easiest way to figure out what prep work you need is to simply look at your formulas. These are all of the formulas that we need for a repeated measures analysis of variance. And remember, most of these formulas are the exact same formulas that we saw previously when we learned how to do a one-way analysis of variance. Let's focus on those formulas first because those should be very familiar to us. So for now, that means we're going to focus on the between treatment source of variation, the within treatment source of variation, and the total source of variation. Let's start at the top. Let's look at sum of squares between treatments. According to that formula, we're going to need to know T values. Remember, T just stands for the total of our group or treatment. All right, let's go take a look at our data. For each treatment, 0 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, let's just compute a total of the values. When the subjects were receiving 0 milligrams of the drug, their wellness scores were 3, 0, 2, 0, and 0. And that sums to 5. Let's look at the 10 milligram condition. 4 and 3 is 7, add 1 you have 8, then 9, then 10. 20 milligram scores. 6 and 3 is 9, add 4 you have 13, then we have 16, and then we have 20. 30 milligrams. 7 and 6 is 13, add 5 you have 18, 22, 25. Let's go back and look at our formulas. In addition to knowing those total values, we also need to know g, which is the grand total, and then we also need to know the small n, which is the number of people within each treatment, and then also the large n, the capital N, which is the total number of scores we have overall. Let's go ahead and take a look at our data. g is just the grand total, so let's just go ahead and sum up all of our totals. 5 and 10 is 15, and 20 is 35, 35 and 25 is 60, so our grand total equals 60. Let's figure out that small n. That small n just represents the number of people within each treatment group, and of course we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So small n equals 5. When we're doing a repeated measures analysis of variance, the large n, the capital N, essentially represents the total number of measurements that we have. Remember, we measured 5 people across four different treatment groups. 5 times 4 is 20. All right, let's go back and look at our formulas. I mentioned that we we're going to start at the top and then move down, so let's move over to degrees of freedom between treatments. We need to know k. k is simply the number of treatments. In our situation, it's easy to see. We have 1, 2, 3, 4 treatments corresponding to 0 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 30 milligrams. So k equals 4. All right, let's move on and see what other prep work we need. Down over here with the within treatment source of variability, 
we need to know the sum of squares within each group. We've computed sum of squares dozens of times in the past, and it takes a little bit of time to do that, so I've already done that for us. So here you can see we know the sum of squares for each group. Let's see what prep work we need for degrees of freedom within treatments. We would need to know N, the capital N, and also K, and we already have that information. All right, let's move down to the total source of variation, and let's see what prep work we might need there. In order to compute sum of squares total, we're gonna to need to know the sum of each value squared. We've already done that in every other ANOVA example that we've gone through. All we would need to do is take every one of these values, square them, and then add up those square values. And I've already done that for us. The sum of all of those squared values is 262. Sum of squares total would also need to know G and capital N, and we already have those values. Degrees of freedom total needs to know capital N, and we already have that value. So far, up to this point, all the prep work that we've done is exactly the same prep work we had to do for the one-way ANOVA that we learned previously. So let's focus on the new stuff. Let's look at this one right here. That's the source of variation for between subjects, and it's often just listed as subjects. That measures the variability due to individual differences between the subjects. Let's look closely at this formula for sum of squares between subjects. We already know the value for capital N. We already know the value for G, and we already know the value for K. All that we need to compute are p-values, and you should see those as person totals. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Remember, for each person, we have multiple measurements at 0 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20, and 30. What I need to compute here is a total for each person. So let's go ahead and do that. For that first person, 3 plus 4 is 7, plus 6 is 13, plus 7 is a total of 20. Second person, 0 plus 3 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 6 is 12. Third person, 2 and 1 is 3, plus 4 is 7, plus 5 is 12. Person number 4, 1 and 3 is 4, plus another 4 is 8. And that last person, 1 and 4 is 5, plus 3 is 8. So now we have totals for each person. Let's go back to our formulas and see if we need anything else. Degrees of freedom between subjects is based on the number of people we have within each treatment group, and we already know that value. So let's move on to the last source of variation, and that's error. Sum of squares error is simply computed based on subtraction. Once we know the value of sum of squares within, we'll subtract the value of sum of squares between subjects. So in this case, there's no prep work we need to do. Let's take a look at degrees of freedom error. We need to know k, which we already know, and we need to know small n, we already know that. So I think we have all of the prep work that we need. We should be able to work through each of the equations and have all the information that's necessary. That said, there's one last thing that I like to do. I always like to compute sample means for each treatment group because when I look at those sample means, that's the best way that I get a feel for knowing what's going on. And of course, we can compute those means very easily. We have totals for each treatment group, and we know that there are n equals 5 people in each group. Let's start with the 0 milligram treatment group. The total for that group is 5. We're going to divide that by the 5 people in that group, so the mean equals 1. 10 milligram group, 10 divided by 5 equals 2. 20 milligram group, the total for that group is 20. 20 divided by 5 equals a mean of 4. And then finally, the 30 milligram group. The total for that group is 25. 25 divided by 5 equals 5. Keep in mind, those means represent average wellness scores. So just as we look at it descriptively, it looks like as people are receiving more medication, their wellness scores are improving. Well, that's a good sign. Let's switch views and go back and then start step one of the four-step hypothesis testing process. Let's state our hypotheses. Remember, the null hypothesis always states no differences, no effect. 
So in this situation, we would say the population mean wellness score for the people taking zero milligrams of the drug is equal to the population mean wellness score for the people taking 10 milligrams of the drug, and that's equal to the population mean wellness score for the people taking 20 milligrams, and that is equal to the population mean wellness score for the people taking 30 milligrams. In other words, there are no differences in wellness scores based on the amount of drug taken by the subjects. Our alternative hypothesis will simply state at least one population mean differs from another. We are doing this particular test just to see if differences exist. If we find that differences exist, we can do post-tests to see where those differences actually are. As always, we proceed as if the null hypothesis is true. So step two tells us how much evidence we need to reject that null hypothesis. In order to find a critical value, we're going to need to know the degrees of freedom between treatments, and we're also going to need to know degrees of freedom error. So let's just go ahead and work on all of the values for degrees of freedom. Let's change views and work on that together. Throughout this entire example, let's focus on the formulas that we're familiar with. So degrees of freedom between, degrees of freedom within, and degrees of freedom total, those are the exact same formulas that we used for the one-way ANOVA that we learned previously. Let's work on those first. Degrees of freedom between treatments. It's simply based on the number of treatments minus one. We looked up K and we found that it was equal to four. Four minus one equals three. Degrees of freedom within treatments is based on the number of measurements we have overall, which is 20, minus the number of groups, which is four. 20 minus four is 16. Degrees of freedom total is based on the number of measurements we have overall minus one. 20 minus one is 19. And you can see this makes sense because 3 plus 16 equals 19. Now let's focus on the new stuff, the formulas that are unique to a repeated measures analysis of variance. Let's compute degrees of freedom between subjects. That's based on the number of subjects that we've measured, the number of people that we've measured, we had five of them, minus one. So that's four. And then we can compute degrees of freedom error two different ways. We can simply take 16 and subtract 4 and find a value of 12. Or we can use this formula right here and make sure that we get the same answer. K minus 1. K represents the number of treatment groups. We had four treatment groups. 4 minus 1 is 3. N represents the number of people that we measured in each treatment group. We had five people in each treatment group. 5 minus 1 is 4. 3 times 4 is indeed 12. So for this test, we have 3 and 12 degrees of freedom, and that's what we need to look up in our F table. Here is our table of critical values for the F distribution based on using an alpha of 0.05. We're going to need to know the degrees of freedom for the numerator. That's degrees of freedom between treatments, and we had 3 degrees of freedom between treatments. Now we need to know the degrees of freedom error, and we know that that was equal to a value of 12. So now I'm just gonna come down this row and look for that column labeled three. And we can see that the critical value is 3.49. So when degrees of freedom equals three and 12, and we're using an alpha of 0.05, our critical value is marked off right about here with an F value of 3.49. 3.49, that's how much evidence we need to reject the null hypothesis. Now we need to move on to step three and find out how much evidence we actually have. And we're going to need to work through each of these formulas until we finally find an F ratio. Along the way, you'll want to fill in the values on this source table. And like I said before, let's stick with the things we're familiar with. Let's stick with the values that are computed just like they're computed using the ANOVA that we learned previously. So in other words, first we're gonna begin with between treatments, then within treatments, and then total. After we work on those computations, then we'll work on the computations for the source of variation between subjects and the source of variation error. 
All right, we've got all of our prep work in front of us, so let's start by computing sum of squares between treatments. The formula begins by asking us to sum up a series of fractions. We need to take each total for each treatment group, square it, and then divide by n. The first treatment group has a total of 5. We need to square it and divide by 5. To that, we add another fraction. The second treatment group has a total of 10. We need to square that and divide by 5. The third treatment group has a total of 20. We need to square that and divide by 5. And then that fourth treatment group has a total of 25. Eventually, we need to square that and divide by 5. According to this formula, we then take the grand total, square it, divide by the overall n, and of course we need to subtract that fraction. So here this says minus, the grand total was 60, we'll have to square that and divide by 20. Remember 20 is the overall n, we have 20 measurements overall, 5 people measured 4 times equals 20 measurements. Let's go ahead and compute those fractions. 5 squared is 25, and we need to divide that by 5. That equals 5. Let's look at the next fraction. 10 squared is 100. We need 100 divided by 5. And of course, that equals 20. Let's look at the next fraction. 20 squared is 400. 400 divided by 5 equals 80. Let's look at the next fraction. Let's take 25 and square it, and then divide by 5. That equals 125. Now we need to subtract that last fraction. In the numerator, we have 60 squared, which equals 3,600, and we need to divide that by 20. That equals 180. Let's go ahead and do that arithmetic. We're left with 5 plus 20 plus 80 plus 125 minus 180. That equals 50. So, sum of squares between treatments equals 50. Next, let's look at sum of squares within treatments. To compute sum of squares within treatments, we simply need to add up the sum of squares within each treatment group. And I've already computed sum of squares for each treatment group ahead of time. So let's just add up those numbers. We have 8 plus 8 is 16, plus another 6 is 22, plus 10 is 32. So, sum of squares within treatments is 32. At this point, we should be able to predict that sum of squares total is going to equal 82, because 50 plus 32 is 82. Let's go ahead and compute that using its own formulas to make sure we're on the right track. Here's the formula for sum of squares total. It begins with the sum of x squared. That's computed right here equals 262. And now we need to subtract this fraction. We need that grand total, which is 60, squared, divided by the overall n, which is 20. Let's go ahead and compute this fraction. We need 60 squared divided by 20, and that equals 180. So we're left with 262 minus 180, and that equals 82. So sum of squares total equals 82, just like we expected. Now let's focus on this new stuff. Let's compute sum of squares between subjects, this value right in here. This is the formula for sum of squares between subjects. This is new to us, but it's structured in a way that should look familiar. We want to add up a series of fractions. In the numerator, we're going to have each person's total value squared divided by k, which is the number of treatment groups. And then we simply want to subtract the grand total squared divided by the overall n. So our attention needs to focus on these person totals. Let's go ahead and walk through the first fraction. That first person has a total wellness score across those four treatments of 20. So we're going to need to take 20 and square it and divide by the number of treatment groups, which is 4. Let's move on to that next person. That next person has a total of 12. Now we have 12 squared divided by 4. That third person also has a total of 12, so we're going to need to take 12, square it, and divide by 4. The fourth person has a total of 8, 8 squared divided by 4, and then that final person, that fifth person, also has a total value of 8, so we'll need to take 8 and square it and divide by 4. 
Now we need to move on to this part of the equation. We're going to subtract the grand total squared divided by n. So minus 60 squared divided by 20. You can see this is a new calculation for us, but really it's structured in the same way as other equations that we've dealt with quite a few times already. So let's go ahead and solve each one of those fractions. In the numerator of that first fraction, we need 20 squared, and we're going to take that and divide by 4. That equals 100. Second fraction, we need to take 12 and square it and then divide by 4. That equals 36. The third fraction has the exact same value, 36. So let's move on to that fourth fraction. We're going to take 8 and square it and then divide that by 4. And that equals 16. And you can see the fraction that follows is exactly the same, so we need to add another 16. Now, let's look at that last fraction. We need to take the grand total, which is 60, and square it, and then divide that by 20. That equals 180. Now, let's just do this arithmetic to find the final value. We'll take 100 and add 36, add another 36, add 16, add another 16, and now subtract 180. That equals 24. Sum of squares between subjects is 24. Once we know that value, sum of squares error is very easy to find. We simply need to take sum of squares within treatments and then subtract sum of squares between subjects. And that's exactly what I'm doing right here for sum of squares error. We take sum of squares within treatments, which is 32, subtract sum of squares between subjects, which is 24, 32 minus 24 is 8. So sum of squares error equals 8. At this point, we've computed sum of squares for each source of variability, and we've also computed degrees of freedom for each source of variability. All that we need to do now is compute mean square between treatments, remember that's variance between the treatments, and then mean square error, remember that's error variance, and then we can compute our F ratio. This is where things start to move pretty quickly. Let's compute mean square between treatments. We need sum of squares between treatments, which right here equals 50, and we'll divide that by degrees of freedom between treatments, which you might recall was equal to 3. 50 divided by 3 is equal to 16.67. Let's go ahead and compute mean square error. Sum of squares error right here is equal to 8, and you might recall that degrees of freedom error was equal to 12. 8 divided by 12 equals about 0.67. Now we have everything that we need to compute our F ratio. So let's take mean square between treatments, which is 16.67, and divide that by mean square error, which is 0.67. That gives us an F ratio of 24.88, which is a pretty large F value. That's our obtained F value. We need to compare that value with our F critical value. Let's do that next. Here is an F value of zero. Here's where our critical value is, 3.49. That marks off the beginning of our critical region. We found an F value of 24.88. That's way out here. F equals 24.88. We are clearly inside this critical region. We are clearly in the rejection zone. Knowing that, yes, we are in the rejection zone, we can now ask ourselves some key follow-up questions. Should we reject the null hypothesis? Yes, we should. Do we have statistically significant results? Yes, we do. Is it possible that we're making a type 1 error? Yes, it is. What's the probability of making a type 1 error? Well, we used an alpha of 0.05, so over the long run, using this type of procedure, we would expect to make type 1 errors about 5% of the time. And then let's address this issue as well. We're going to have to figure out if the probability of finding our results just by chance is less than 5% or if that probability is greater than 5%. And let me remind you, we found that our F ratio was in this small region, that small critical region. So it should be associated with a small probability. What's small? A probability less than 5% or a probability greater than 5%? 
Of course, what is small is a probability less than 5%. Okay, let's go ahead and write up our results a little bit more formally in step four. The first thing we need to address is if we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Our F ratio is clearly inside the critical region. This is very unlikely if the null hypothesis is true, and that's why we reject the null hypothesis. The next thing we need to do is discuss our results in everyday language. So one way we can put it is that significant differences in wellness exist among the treatment groups. The next thing we need to do is show how these results would appear in a journal article. We conducted an F test. That's what an ANOVA is. So we did an F test with 3 and 12 degrees of freedom. The value that we obtained was 24.88, and the probability of finding that value just by chance was very small, less than 5%. Remember, just by their nature, all F ratios are positive. So we're not doing a one-tailed test in terms of making specific predictions, but all F tests are one-tailed tests simply due to their structure. So we don't need to list that. Everybody already knows that. The last thing that we need to do is compute the most appropriate measurement of effect size. And in this case, we're going to compute eta squared. When we do a repeated measures analysis of variance, the formula that we use for eta squared is just a little bit different than the formula that we used previously. The numerator is still based on sum of squares between treatments. And remember, sum of squares is just the basis for computing variability between those treatment groups. In this case, we divide by the sum of squares total, which is just a measurement of variability overall, minus sum of squares between subjects. Essentially, we're dividing by the total variability after we exclude the individual differences of the participants. Sum of squares between groups was equal to 50. Sum of squares total is equal to 82. And sum of squares between subjects is equal to 24. So we're left with this fraction right here, 50 divided by 58. 50 divided by 58 equals 0 0.86. 0.86. Remember, eta squared represents the proportion of variability in the dependent variable that can be explained by the independent variable. So in this case, 86% of the variability in the wellness scores can be explained by the level of medicine the subjects received. I know that was a lot of work, my friends, but we just computed our first repeated measures analysis of variance. In the next video, I'm going to go through another example. I'll see you then. In the meantime, be safe.